Hello, everyone. My name is Walter Sweat. Uh, I'm the CTO hit here at Estadia, and I would like to welcome you today to the latest edition of our Walter's World podcast series. Uh, today, I'm delighted to have one of my compatriots, Mario Meese, who is the uh, Managing Director for Modernization Solutions here at Estadia, join us. Uh, Mario has recently authored a new booklet that I have found to be just completely fascinating, uh, and I thought that it might be very interesting for you, the audience, to be able to hear a little bit about this book and Mario's experience and background. So, Mario, welcome very much. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure. Glad to have you here. Now, Mario, you are renowned in this space, but for those members of our audience who perhaps haven't had the chance to meet you yet, could you give us a little summary of your career? Uh, yes, glad to. Thank you. Um, so uh, I joined uh, about 10 years ago a company called Anivex, which then uh, merged or was acquired by Astadia uh, a bit more than a year ago. And uh, before that, I spent time with uh, also uh, other American companies, the last one being Microsoft. But at Anivex, uh, the last 10 years, let's say, uh, because we were a very small company, actually, I had the opportunity to, to do a lot of things. Like uh, I spent a lot of time on uh, kind of... Uh, co-defining, I would say, the, the product strategy, the positioning, the branding, uh, also the, the, the pricing of the products. But I also had the opportunity uh, to do a lot of uh, sales engagements, uh, talk with partners and do partner management. And even I was involved in a lot of uh, projects, delivery projects, and not as a project manager or, or anything close, but more on the steering committee level, uh, overseeing the, 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 the quality, let's say, and the timely delivery. So in a short, in short, I, I talked a lot the past ten years with partners, clients, and prospects. I know that I have really enjoyed getting to work with you and see the way that you interact with with organizations, understanding their challenges and their problems, and helping them to find solutions. So uh, it has been a pleasure getting to work with you, sir. Likewise, Walter. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. So I mentioned that you've written a book. Uh, could you tell us kind of what prompted you to write this book? Your mainframe is holding you hostage. Yes. Uh, um, yeah. Um, well, in, in talking with those uh, CIOs, enterprise architects uh, over all these years, I realized that, you know, um, when, when these people are considering alternatives, let's say, for their mainframe, um, it's not their daily business, right? They have a lot of experience in doing a, a lot of uh, very complicated things, you know, running the operations of the mainframe or developing projects for mainframe or implementing packages, what have you. Um, but, but migrating a mainframe, for example, is something that they have typically never done before and most probably will not do anymore uh, either, again, once it's done. So it's a one-off. They, they don't have the expertise with all, that they have in all the other aspects of the, the daily business to rely upon. And um, so th that prompted me that mm, maybe it's a good thing to, to, to kind of write what it is about all, also. But, but what I also realized after a while is that these people, they do tend to, to, to rely on, on certain uh, things they know about risk management, things they know about, about planning and, and all, all that kind of, all those, that, that good stuff that not necessary is correct or applies in a migration project. Because at the end of the day, a migration project is something completely different. And what intuitively might, might, might be a very good and very wise thing to do could be, you know, quite, have quite the opposite effect in a migration project. So that's also what I tried, all, you know, addressing all these misconceptions uh, is also something I try to do uh, in, in the booklet. And then last but not least, while, while there are a, uh, quite a few uh, taxonomies out there for, from large vendors, um, none of them went a step further and tried to introduce also kind of an evaluation framework based on that taxonomy. And maybe I was too ambitious there, but I also <laughs> introduced a, a, an evaluation framework and even filled it in for a general case. But that evaluation framework can be filled in by anybody uh, for their specific case or extended or, or what have you. So that's uh, that's why I you know felt compelled to to write this booklet. Well, I know I was uh, extremely impressed when I read it, uh, seeing how you had helped to delineate not just being knowledgeable about the mainframe, which all of our customers and companies are, but to integrate 
that migration effort, because they are indeed different things. And having something that kind of highlights where it's important to merge those capabilities together, I think you did an exceptional job within mm -hmm. the book. Thank you so much, Walt. Okay. Um, now, okay. concerning the topic of mainframe holding you hostage, what are some of the factors that you can think of, Mario, that contribute to a mainframe being able to do that to an organization? Yeah, well, let, let me also say we also appreciate, of course, what the mainframe does, has done, and still will do over many, many years uh, for, for the, the customers and for the, the workloads they provide and, and the fantastic uh, machine it is. But but there are some buts. Um, I think there's this you know you can you can categorize these buts in, in many ways, slice and dice in many ways. But I think you can bring it back basically to three things that uh, are problematic or, or are becoming more and more problematic. First of all, there is the cost. There is this perception that a mainframe is expensive, and that perception is is unfortunately also often proven by by you know by by, by data, so to speak. Yeah? Uh, so a mainframe is expensive, uh, and it, it turns out that for many, many clients, a non-mainframe-based alternative is simply cheaper to run and cheaper to maintain and, 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 and what have you. So that is definitely a, an, an important argument, I think, that you know, is, uh, we should look at. The second is the skills, um, and, and that has come up, or is, that, that issue is growing and has been growing over the past years. And it's skills in many ways, first of all, of course, on the operations side. And I mean, not a lot of people uh, know how to create an LPAR anymore, uh, or, or even also, you know, JCL skills, uh, all these kind of things, CICS skills, uh, GP monitoring general skills. That's, that's not, um, not around anymore. Um, what's, what's more problematic is even on the, on the development side, you know, programming language, certainly, and it's always the case, uh, certainly all the programming languages like natural or ads um, you know there's not a lot of people out there anymore but even COBOL, and and we all know uh, you know that there are many COBOL adapts and, and still love the language and COBOL the usage uh, you know is, has been growing is still growing uh, yes but you know the past decades probably not a lot of people have graduated uh, with with COBOL in the on their curriculum anymore and i know also that that has been addressed by organizing uh, classes and, and you can train people, you know, a program, you can train a program in COBOL, but we all know that people who, who graduate from, from, from the schools these days that have learned Java and all this, this good stuff, they rather they might rather be, be programming games or, 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 or fancy stuff in Java or what have you. So it is not those people that you will attract to, to train in COBOL. And, and we've had that feedback also from clients. They said, yeah, we, we, fi we find, we found and we still find people we can train in COBOL. But after a, a couple of years, we had to realize and confess to ourselves, these are not the top talents anymore that we used to have. And these are not the top programmers because otherwise they would, you know, they would be probably doing something else. So long story, but, but also that is skills is definitely an issue. Uh, so, and, and yeah, on the mainframe, you, you often, most often you still have pro, uh, programs like COBOL or PL1 and you, you, don't, you don't program in Java on the mainframe, not yet at least. Um, and the third one is agility. So people are used to th these days to, uh, you know, have, have iPad-like interfaces or iPhone-like interfaces, search, search possibilities like Google, and they, they expect that in their job also. Even on the development side, you have DevOps, you have IDEs, all these modern things that typically, again, do not come out on the mainframe. And, you know, there's, there's, you, you simply don't, don't have that agility. Uh, to cope with all these things, introduce microservices in a very easy way. The tools are not available on the mainframe to do that. So agility is definitely also the third issue. For you, I'm curious, um, and I've certainly seen the same where there are organizations who suffer the consequences of cost or agility or people skills. Do, do you find that there are organizations who actually suffer from all three of those challenges? I think to some extent, every mainframe organization suffers from, from all three. And but for some at the moment, it's, it's, less the, it's less a pressing issue than for others. There's, there's large banks out there that still have you know, plenty of COBOL developers, for example. So that skill is, is less of an issue for them. Uh, all, but, but in general, I would say there is one particular category that definitely suffers from that, that, is, that are these people, these mainframe users that are, that are not yet 
in I would call the modern mainframe. So with a relational database and, and you know a language like COBOL, but that are still in, in pre-relational uh, databases with associated 4GLs, like I mentioned already, Beefy, I think, Adabas Natural, uh, IDMS with, a, with ADS, those kind of environments. These are maybe not even a, a relational database. I think those people are definitely so, uh, you know, suffering from, from, from these issues more than, than the others, but, but everybody somehow is, is, is affected, I think. Yeah, I know in the last 25 years, I have yet to see an organization who says, you know what, I'm not paying too much for my mainframe. I've got more COBOL programmers than I know what to do with, and I can keep up with changing business needs. There is always something, and sometimes, as you say, all three components that come into play. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, now, we've talked about in the past the, the infamous Gartner 5 R's, um, right. you know, rewrite, replace, re-architect, the, and they go on. Sometimes it's six, sometimes it's seven, and now sometimes I hear even eight different R's. Um, I would be interested to know from your perspective, Mario, how do companies decide which of the, the multiple five R's are most appropriate for them to consider? Yeah, I've I've also you know to as 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 I said I've introduced this kind of uh, framework uh, that you know helps people decide with traffic light analysis, and um, I've 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 extended it in the book for for a number of these R's. So on on the very high level, I've I've taken five R's as you say. So the first one is retire. You know it it happens very seldom. Maybe in a merger like two companies merge and one of the applications gets retired. Uh, sometimes maybe the last policy of a longstanding insurance uh, is, 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 has come to an end and, and the application can get retired. But that's the first one. Reuse is one that we see very often. And that's where the, the lifetime of a mainframe is kind of extended of, or an application is extended. It's an encapsulated. Uh, and that's, that's the words that are used for this all. So the third one is rebuilt. That means you, you kind of um, rewrite the, the application from scratch. That, that happens sometimes, but according to the same specs. You know, these parallel, parallelism by analysis is avoided by just taking yeah. the same specs and people rebuild the application in a modern uh, environment. The, the last one, or the fourth one is replaced. It's not the last one, sorry. The fourth one is replaced, sometimes also called re envision where they say, well, this application does not longer support the business needs. The application is out of date. It's from a functional or business supporting point of view. And you just, according to new specs, rewrite parts or the entire application, pure new development or uh, implementation of a package. And of course, these are pretty easy, I think, to decide and to, 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 to see what you, what you need. The fifth one is, is a totally different category. I've called them renovate. Um, and renovate, under renovate, you would have um, a, a, a number of subcategories. And renovate means really that you have a legacy. But that legacy, um, you know, I, I at least, when, when I, I talk about or use the word leg legacy, I use, I, I think about two things. It's first of all, it's, it's something old. A legacy is, is by definition old. But secondly, it's also something of value that you inherit. And many mainframe applications are called legacy. Um, but I think with the two meanings, they're old, but they still have a lot of value. Um, unless they do not support the business, we covered that. And then what? Then what, what, what can you do with it? Um, there's a, and there's a lot of opportunities because um, when you want to renovate, you can do this with, with tools, with, with offerings. So you want to extend, in other words, the lifespan uh, of the application. And within the renovate category, basically there are um, there are there are a number of flavors also. There, there, there's there's four, and and of each flavor there's even sub flavors. The four uh, are rehost, you, you know, replatform, you do it with uh, with software, refactor. That means you're going to change the language also, and then last but not, not least, um, rearchitect. And in, in the booklet, uh, the framework talks about these, the pros and cons, the sub flavors of these, and we also evaluate them according to six criteria. And these six criteria are the first three are the ones we just talked about. You know, the, how well do they solve the issues that, that we see there, uh, the, the issue of cost, skills, and uh, agility. 
And then there are three, let's say, more project or result oriented uh, criteria. That is, first of all, the product duration. If it takes six years to do it, it's maybe not a good idea. The cost, the cost is, of course, also influenced uh, partially by the, product, uh, by the product duration, but there's definitely other aspects also. And last but not least, I find personally very, very important also, that is the risk of a new lock-in. Yeah, because again, I, I might sound like a broken record, but certainly these people with old 4GLs and stuff, they have been locked in an environment that, that they had, had a hard time getting out and they had to pay money every year. So the last thing you want is to end up again in such a situation, I think. So that's the six criteria that are introduced to evaluate each approach, basically. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Um, let's talk about Renovate for a second. I'm curious, how important do you feel that automation is uh, to the effort when we're in that renovation category? I think automation is, is key and autom automation is extremely important. And I know there are solutions out there uh, for, for many, many good reasons that, you know, do not go as far as 100%, and I'll come back to what 100% means. Uh, but I, I think those solutions typically only work for small applications. Um, and we've seen that in the past years, they deliver excellent results. So let there be no misunderstanding. Uh, the results are, are excellent. Um, but if you don't automate, you can maybe handle like an application of 500,000, maybe 1 million, let's say, one million lines of code and, and more is, is, is simply impossible. The, the task becomes too daunting, uh, too risky, takes too long, uh, testing becomes too difficult. So automation is key. And automation, I think um, one should look at three levels of automation. The first one is probably straightforward. That is automation of the transformations and, and the conversions. Your, your, your data structures go from VSAM to a relational database or what have you, from DB2 maybe to, to Aurora DB or SQL Server, what have you. Um, also the language. You need to make sure the language is converted 100%. This can be COBOL to COBOL. Quite straightforward again. That's the compiler difference that you have to handle. But it's also COBOL to Java, COBOL to natural, uh, natural to, to Java, COBOL to C Sharp. Also that, I think, should be the tra those transformations should be done 100% automated. I'm a strong believer in that. That's the only way to handle, you know, uh, 10 million lines of code, 20 million lines of code in a, in a feasible way. Um, the second level of automation that you need to introduce according to, uh, to our view, I think, is, is testing. Um, the, main, the main aspect of a migration project is not, not the conversions and transformation, but it's the testing. You know, it's a huge testing effort. Most of the time, clients do not have up-to-date test cases available anymore. So you also have to, to find a way to deal with that and automate the testing. Because migrating uh, 10 million lines of code means basically you do the migration maybe that day. You do it often, you know, it's, you do it again and again and again until you have the trust and the confidence and everything works perfectly. So that means you have to do the conversions again and again, but also you have to do the testing again and again. And automated testing, by the way, will not only discover things that we might discover also by doing it manually or semi-manually, but also even things that we would we would have a hard time to find, like attribute values, like protected fields and stuff like that. If they should be the same, you know, they should be the same. Uh, and that that's the testing. And last but not least, the third level is the process itself. So also the migration process, so the steps that need to be gone through, you know, uh, convert the screens, convert the data, launch the testing product, uh, all, hold that cycle. That should also be put in a pipeline, uh, which is automated, and you can then just make sure you have everything ready, push the button, and the whole process starts again and again and again. And that's, that's, that's how I believe successful migration projects for large scale uh, enterprise applications can and should be done. That and standard methodology is so important and ensuring, as you mentioned, that testing is accounted for with the intensity that it deserves is critical on these yes. migrations. Absolutely, Walter. Um, I'd like to go back to cost for a second. Something that is relatively new or newer in the marketplace now is the concept of subscription pricing versus perpetual pricing. I'm, I'm curious your thoughts about how people need to consider those as different factors to take into account. I, I assume we're talking about here of the, the, 
the vendor delivered IP yes. during the new application, right? Yes. Yeah, that is a very, very good question. Well, a very interesting one. Um, as a vendor, you know, I, I work with uh, I stayed and I was, the answer would be subscription, of course, because then we, <laughs> <laughs> it is an easy way for us to earn money. Um, you think you're giving. <laughs> yeah, but but if you maybe let me let me share a short story. You know, I come from from Anibex. Um, at Anibex, we the way you know we, we were originally not a, not a migration uh, company. Uh, we were in the we were in, in packages for for uh, for service companies, and we ended up building migration tools because we built built it for ourselves. We we ran our our package on a uh, obsolete mid-range platform in those days. So we built migration tools to do it, and other other clients of that mid-range platform came to see us and say, "Hey, can you help us also?" So we 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 kind of ended up in this space as a client <laughs> rather than as a vendor, and we still have the mentality of a client at least. So I think we we are a vendor that uh, likes to think as a client at least. So, and from, with that head on, from that perspective, I would say, you know, you have to go for perpetual license. You have to ask you as a client. You have to ask your your vendor to to you know provide a perpetual license because you do not want a commercial lock-in anymore in anything uh, in, in the future um, because you have been locked in too, too long, too much in, in, these, in, the, in this mainframe system, certainly if you had these four DLs. Um, and you might think, you might think, oh, it's a temporary solution. You know, I, it will take us 10 years and then we will work our way out of it because we will refactor that thing. We all know we have been in IT uh, for a long time. You know, that's, those 10, de- 10 years, excuse me, will definitely become at least 20 years that you, you sign up your company to pay this. Uh, so I would say, yeah, uh, perpetual. That, that would be my vote. Uh, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, thinking about the renovation phase again and the options that are there, one of the things that comes into play when historically people have considered refactoring and automated refactoring, you heard the phrases Joe Ball and Franken code. Do you feel that, and while I think in the past, they may have absolutely been appropriate 10 years ago, do you feel that in today's market that they really are applicable in the same way? No, I, I think, I really think they're, they're not anymore, by far not. Older. And um there's a number of, of things to tell about it. Uh, is it again a very very interesting question? Um, first of all, like we ourselves, we have uh, products to go from Cobol, for example, to, to Java. And uh, let's talk about the Jobol. Um, in, in general, I think it's 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 I kind of all in all honesty, I can say all our clients are extremely satisfied and happy with the quality of the Java they get. Uh, that's definitely a statement I dare to make here, and I'm sure no client will disagree with that. Um, one of the reasons maybe is also because we have a feature, we have a lot of features in our, in our conversion uh, products that you can that you can set and it, it generates one or the other style of Java, uh, how to treat that code, all these kinds of things. Um, on top of that, we offer our clients also always the opportunity if they have a way to, to convert COBOL to Java and it's not yet uh, uh, built into the product, we will add it uh, under one condition, of course, we must be able to automate it. If that condition is met, we will add it the, to the product and we extend the product that way um, all the time. Um, and also we, we get satisfied clients. So at the end, I think we deliver pretty, pretty decent uh, Java. That being said, that will never be Java or C Sharp uh, as you would write it from scratch. A Java a developer that would start writing an application from scratch would write different Java. That that is a case, of course. But then you have to you have to think about okay, what am I talking about now? If I say this is this is Jobal, this is not Java. Um, is it the, is the style of code, or and some people uh, kind of confuse these two, or is it maintainability? Exactly. If it, yeah. If it's a style of code, it's it's indeed it's a subjective thing. You know, it's do you like it, the Java? Does it use the libraries you like to use? Yes or no? So that's that's subjective. And to that, I would also say, even if you don't if you don't like certain things right after the conversion, you're now in the latest and greatest environment, you're not in the mainframe anymore. You have the latest and greatest tools available to further refactor, do whatever you like with that Java. 
There, of course, you have to make sure you're not dependent on the vendor. You know, the lock-in that we just talked about also from that can also be from a technical point of view, not only from a commercial point of view, obviously. So you have to make sure you, you have a, a vendor that provides that opportunity. And uh, once you, you, you can do that. But on the, other, on the other end of the spectrum, we also have clients, and, and it all depends, you know, we have clients that want to take their developers with them on the journey away from the maintenance, yes. on the journey away from COBOL. Those clients, they, they will choose all those options in the products that, you know, are close to the COBOL. And, and they, like, they like that also. And in both cases anyway, um, apart from style of code, then the maintainability of code, we have, we have excellent results there also that the code, that, that the people who maintain the code, they are more productive. So in other words, this is an objective criterion. Changes are made faster than before. And that's, I think that's what really comes also at the end of the day in, in a company, because you have to run a company uh, like, like a good house father, right? So uh, money is also important. Indeed. I think that it's critically important to, to consider like for like, being able to ensure that what has worked for you for 20, 30, 40 years that you can depend upon on day one works exactly the same. And then to pick and choose where you want to alter and you want to extend and you want to change the, the structure of programs, you have that ability, but you're guaranteed that you're starting from a solid, proven starting point. Absolutely. That, that is really spot on, Walter. And I think also, you know, that we also do natural and natural has this, this, uh, this feature that the, the code sits in the repository so you can see when it was last maintained, last changed. And there we find typically indeed that 80% often has not been changed the last 10 years. Of the exactly. Code. Beauty so, of the mainframe, it can work forever. And then, you know, indeed uh, make, make it go like for like, make sure, and then work on those 20% and the latest and greatest uh, technologies again, once off mainframe. That would, Absolutely. Uh, I think that would be a wise thing to do. I agree. Um, I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, we get into this philosophical discussion a lot with clients I know about the concepts of refactoring versus re-architecting, kind of starting from scratch or uh, pulling out business rules and reconstructing them and doing something different with them. And to me, it's almost a philosophical difference and approach. I'm curious, do, do you think that there is a right or a wrong, or is it something that's unique for, for every client? Um, I don't think there's a, 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 a right or wrong in general, but it depends, I guess, on, on what the application, like we just said, I, I'm, I'm, if, you, if you want to deal with a, a 10 million lines of code application or 20 million lines of code, I, I really, in, in all honesty, don't think re-architecting will, will do it for you. It will not work. It will take you years. Uh, probably it will fail because you, you're mixing two things. You're mixing getting out of the mainframe with changing the application at the same time. And so that introduces a lot of risk also. And, 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 and you know, acceptance could you get blurred. There's so many, many things. You, I think the results for a small application of re-architecting re on the other hand will, can be great. Yeah, but I think, as I said, the limit is somewhere around 1 million max, 1 million lines of code. Under that, I would say, yeah, go and, and do re-architecting. It will take you a while, but it's worth it probably. Uh, and it's feasible. Uh, you can manage the risk, but above that, please, please stay away from it. That would be my, my advice. Yeah. And I don't know about you. I also think as you consider re-architecting, you have to really take into account the extra amount of testing that can be required because changing business rules somewhere along the way, uh, that can be terribly difficult to find and the impact can be quite dramatic. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, that's, that's really, that's a, that's a tough one then. Indeed. And, 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 the, and the acceptance criteria again, eh? you know, testing and the acceptance criteria. Yeah. Good point. Very true. Very true. Thanks. Mario, something I'm often asked uh, after these podcasts, people want to know, um, can we really expect to see adequate performance to what we're used to on the mainframe when we, move away from the mainframe. I'd like to know some of your experiences and your thoughts, if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. That's a, that's a good one. And that's one that indeed uh, often always uh, kind of pops up. And, 
Yeah, it's very important. And, and we do have a lot of experience now after all these years migrating mainframe applications of the mainframe. And uh, sometimes people are worried about the performance of the online. So that I think there's two things. You have the online part of, of the, the applications and the batch part. For the online, when people have a lot of data entry, uh, for example, um, they what, what's of course uh, important is the response time. You know, a screen hits a, a key, what is the response time? Now, typically those response times are in milliseconds. We're talking about 30 milliseconds or something on the mainframe. And uh, when we go off mainframe, we do have network latency. And you cannot, that's, it's a different architecture, it's a different environment. So if, when people have response time for 95% of their transactions, let's say of 35 second, milliseconds, probably will not, we will not reach that. Uh, now we reach, we, what, what we know from experience is for a 95%, we can reach 50, 60 milliseconds sometimes. Depends a little bit, sometimes even 90 milliseconds as uh, at, for 95%. But you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I think nobody can distinguish or can 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 even see the difference between, let's say, 35 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds. So from the online perspective, I think nobody should worry. We know from experience we've done many many times. It it will be okay. It will work. It will do the job. The the one that also more more people worry about is the batch part eh? because yes. people have been. People have been working on their batch uh, window, their batch chain, often uh, for many, many years, optimized everything, try to squeeze it in, in the night window that they have available. And sometimes even the, the, it's so, it's so uh, tight that you know, the, the batch stops at, at 7.30 or something, and they have half an hour left before the, the first people start with the online work. So that's, that's, that's a a big worry for many people, especially because they also have been optimized all those things over so many decades. So they think it's not going to work right away. Now, I know this is, for example, one we talked about counterintuitive. We used that word uh, earlier in our, in, our, in our talk. I think for many mainframe people, this is counterintuitive, but they can also be, or yeah, they can also rest assured, you know, the, the batch performance will also be better after migrating away from the, from the mainframe. And we have that experience. We've seen it with clients. It will take some tuning for sure. It will not just happen like that from day one. It will take some performance tuning, but there are ways to do it. And of course, why is it better? Because we can use those fantastic capabilities of, of uh, cloud-based environments where you can scale out uh, in all that kind of directions. And that, that is an enormous benefit that you simply do not have on, on a, in the mainframe architecture that, that comes into play. And that also make uh, make life uh, of, you know, or make you know the batch performance not an issue anymore, basically. Um, and I absolutely have seen the same that structured correctly, people will see better batch. And it takes effort sometimes. You have to tune the database, you have to tune the process, and it works. Uh, something that you mentioned, and you're spot on with it, I think, is that you know the mainframe online thirty milliseconds a user. If it takes them 50 milliseconds, they really can't measure that. They're not going to know it. Where it does come into play, if you're doing 10 million transactions a day, there's increased usage on the mainframe, so there's increased cost. But moving to a new platform, you don't have those same costs. So no. it's, it's not a concern. It's not a as often a technical concern as it is a business concern. And the reduced cost capabilities off of the mainframe make that a non-entity after a period of time, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very, very good point indeed. Thank you for bringing this up also. We've, yeah. uh, we've talked a couple of times about black box solutions. I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about should organizations, as they investigate options, consider how much a black box solution can impact them moving forward? Yeah. Very interesting point, and, and I also address it in, in the booklet. Um, I think they should. Now, I know from experience, some people don't mind too much, but if I would be a client, and as I said, we like to put on the head of, of a client also, I think you don't want to lock in uh, from a commercial point of view, so you want you want a virtual license, but also from a technical point of view, you don't want to lock in. So I think I would, I would look for a vendor that 
and, and the standards out there, including ourselves, that provide also the source code of the pre-existing IP. So we, we do provide certain libraries, for example, a Cobalt to Java library, but people receive it in source code. So it's not a black box. They can, they can see what it does. They can, you know, they can, it's, it becomes part of their application because it's Java like any other piece of Java that they have. And if I would be a client, that would be something I would be looking out for. I would, I would select vendors uh, based on, on that criteria also, to be honest. Uh, because again, the last thing you want is another lock-in, also from a technical point of view. Yeah, the, uh, I think we see a lot of organizations who become customers, hopefully, who suffer from that technology debt where they did make decisions that kind of locked them in before. So not, not replicating that same situation uh, appears to be a plus, I would agree. Yeah, I agree. Um, Mario, I'd like to ask any any closing thoughts as we get close to the uh, to the end of this podcast. That any thoughts you might like to share with our audience? Well, thank you for asking because there's one thing that comes to mind. And and at at, the, at again at the start of our, of, our, of our chat, we said uh, after all for our, our our CIOs and application architects, this is not their daily business, right? And hopefully the, the booklet will help them. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, but also I would advise them also, if, if you want to embark on such a journey and you have your selected your partners, your shortlist or whoever, please, please, you know, go and, and ask them to talk to their references. I, I think that is key. Uh, it's key for, for two reasons. First of all, it will, of course, help you to, to, to judge how sound the solution of the partner is, how, 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 uh, how well thought through, how, how experienced these people are, um, um, how mature the solution is, but also you will learn from those clients also. So that's the second aspect. You will you will you will learn the pitfalls that they went through. You know what worked for them, what they they would do different now than they than they did before. Uh, so I think that would be that's 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 a key thing I would advise everybody to do before embarking on such a such an endeavor, such an initiative. What a what a great thought. Thank you. Uh, Mario, since the subject for this podcast was your new booklet, um, and I just know that the audience is going to be very interested in seeing more of what you got to share along the topics that we talked about, might I ask you how people can get access to the uh, to the booklet? Yes, there's there's a number of ways. There is a, an electronic version. Well, there, uh, for sake of completeness, there is one available on Amazon. So if you do a search on my name and and uh, the mainframe is holding your hostage, I'm sure you will it will pop up. Uh, but then you have to buy it. You can buy it electronically there, and soon there will be a, a print copy available there also. But you can also uh, get get your free copy uh, from us. Um, we will have a landing page soon on our website at Astadia, um, where you can order both uh, from us for free. Uh, and last but not least, if you really can have a hard time getting a hold of it, uh, please mail me at mario.mies at uh, outlook.com or mario.mies at astadia.com. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you will, will be able to help you. It will be a pleasure. Privilege okay. to help. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mario. Really Thank do you all. Taking the time today. Uh, I know that this had to have been very helpful for the people attending. And uh, uh, thank you again for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for, for your time, all for the great, great questions. Thanks. All and right. for the audience, thank you all for taking the time today. We really hope you appreciate this latest version of the Walters World podcast. And I'd like to ask, please stay uh, attuned. Keep looking at uh, www.estadia.com for information about upcoming podcasts. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.